It's the Pond La Hockey Eagles postgame show with the gang right here at Ocean Casino. Let's bring in the man who covers the Eagles for Jacob Media. And uh, I just read a, a, a quote from Jalen Hurts, John McMullen. It says that um, the Eagles are not committed enough right now. And a cynic would say that maybe the quarterback wasn't that committed either tonight. But what is your reaction to losing this game and where they are right now, sir? Uh, tough loss, obviously. You don't want to uh, go into that situation. You know, Seattle's a difficult place to play, but you're talking about a backup quarterback. You, you had the good first quarter. It felt a little bit empty after you only had the 10 nothing lead after you didn't push in the second uh, good drive. And then you're up late in the game and you give up uh, a, a drive to Drew Locke with, uh, you know, a 92-yard drive um, with less than two minutes on the clock. It's just not acceptable. So, you know, numbers-wise, you talk about the, the change defensive play calling. They look okay, 297 total yards. They were better in third downs, although the game winner was third and 10. Uh, they didn't give up any red zone touchdowns, um, so that part was better. But you're playing a, 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 a poor offense, so that was the whole point. Like, it was kind of baked in, and that's why I didn't like this change away from Sean to sign week 15. Well, for a couple reasons. Baked in, you were going to get better statistically because you're playing poor teams. It's probably going to get better with the New York Giants coming in on Christmas. And then you open up the door to every single yahoo on the planet to start asking you questions about brian johnson because you're struggling um offensively and 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 the eagles kind of scoff at that why why would you scoff at it you're the ones who changed the defensive play caller so you open the door to everything at this point struck me as a panicky move and hey they couldn't stop the bleeding and now we're sitting here with three consecutive losses um, second time in Nick Sirianni's coaching career. So it's not good. Let's put it that way. John, how do they uh, empty the bench defensively? And you have guys like Keely Ringo who makes his first start. Nolan Smith seems like he was out there before the injury more than we had ever seen him play at. Uh, and you see guys, uh, Josh Job get out there a lot more than we have seen him as well. How do you have guys like that play as much as they did in this game? You only allow 20 points in total and you lose this football game. How does that happen? Well, you hope the quarterback was truly, you know, affected by the illness because Jalen Hurts was not good. I should say, you know, he was good running the football. He's probably better running the football than he has been all season. Uh, tied Cam Newton's uh, single season record for rushing touchdowns. That's a, uh, a silver lining to the statistical people, I guess. But you know, his passer rating was 40.1. You look at the second interception to Julian Love, you you, you, you wonder about the decision-making. Look, you're trying to get into field goal range for, for Jake Elliott, and you're taking a shot down the field. Didn't understand that because it didn't look like a good shot. It's never a good shot to Quez Watkins down the field. That's a shout-out to my partner, Jody McDonald, who can't stand Quez. But... Um, <laughs> You know, he, he, he keeps taking these deep shots and not taking the easy layup throws. And you never want to see a quarterback uh, who had the season Jalen Hurts had last year regress a little bit. And I think we're seeing that. We certain, Hopefully, today he was outplayed by Drew Locke. Hopefully that had to do with the illness. Um, and I don't expect him to play that poorly moving forward. But he wasn't good today in the passing game. Nick Sirianni said that they just need to weather the storm at this point of the season. Is these three losses just the slump the Eagles are in right now? Do you feel like they can bounce back? Now, they don't really have a super tough schedule, but do you think they're underlooking teams at this point, and do you think they'll kind of shape up against the Giants? Well, I think they'll shape up against the Giants. I mean, it's it's Tommy DeVito. It's Tommy Cutlets. I mean, if they don't show up, shape up against the Giants, it's time to pack it in. Um, they're going to be in deep, deep trouble if they can't beat that team. And so, yeah, I I think short term they're gonna they're gonna write the ship on Christmas, 
but that's not the issue. Can they play with the San Francisco 49ers? You know, this team is Super Bowl or bust. That's why they're doing all this. this that's why they're they're bringing Matt Patricia in as the defensive play caller, uh, promoting him. That's why they're demoting Sean Desai because they they think the championship window is open. Do you guys think the championship window is open? Because a lot of things would have to go wrong for the San Francisco 49ers to lose to this team right now, as long as San Francisco stays healthy. They're just better. Hey, Did you John, just ask us a, uh, that question? Hey, John. <laughs> no. I'll, <answer. laughs> yeah, I'll, no. Say, I'll say no also to that. that John, that's you, the you, better, you, you better get your fingers out that window pane if you think that their, window, that their Super Bowl window is still open or you're about to lose some of them. I said um, they think that. I, I said even, they think. Even them, they better get their hands out of the window too <laughs> because if that's what they believe, you know, they're 100% mistaken. Um, it's not outside of the possibility that they may lose one of these three games that's left. You know, the way this football team is playing, you know, there is no recourse at this point in time for them to get better. You're not going to get better over the last, you know, three weeks of the season. The time to do that is in the off season the preseason, and as you go through, you know, the, the beginning half of the year. At this point in time, if you're not peaking, you know, you're either plateauing or you're going down the other side of the mountain. And this is where I see this football team right now. All these moves that they're making, they're making out of desperation, and the desperation is showing to the players how desperate they are, not only as an organization from the top down, but also as a coaching staff to make these moves and to kind of upset the apple cart and create this environment of where they are. The offense looks yeah. anemic. It looks like they don't know what they want to do whatsoever. And defensively, you know, they're completely lost at this point in time. Yeah, and you, you look at some of the defensive changes. Mark kind of mentioned, you know, you see obviously Ringo is, is in his first NFL start. I like that athleticism on the field. Should have done it a little bit earlier, but, you know. Um, and Eli Ricks is closing the game. Why? Even the decisions they make. Josh Joe getting in. And, and Nolan Smith. Patrick Johnson we saw for the first time. Um, Sidney Brown. I saw a lot of fans complaining about the missed tackles. Yeah, all right. He, he missed some significant tackles but you can see the athleticism where would he be in week 15 if you if you kick-started him earlier we'll never know um and now you're seeing the growing pains live and in living color i don't know how much you can do defensively in a lot of ways offensively is is probably worse because you have talent on the offensive side and they can't get things going and again, I'm going to give Jalen a pass because of the illness, but today was Jalen. Let's be honest. The running game was solid. Uh, it wasn't great, but it was solid. DeAndre Swift, 18 for 74. Um, no explosive runs, but it was effective. That's the word I always use. It was effective. Um, Devontae Smith was getting open. A.J. Brown was getting open. There was separation. Um, Dallas got her early in the game. Um, and he's not taking, as I said, he's not taking the layups. For some reason, he keeps trying to push the football down the field a little bit too much. That's great when it works. When it doesn't work and you see first downs underneath and you're not taking that, you know, what the heck is going on with this decision making? Why is it regressing to this point? Now, today it was... Uh, as I said, a 40 passer rating. That's not going to be typical. But this is this has been a, a, a pretty serious regression from the quarterback over this three-game losing streak. And I think everybody wants to point out obvious issues and they want to protect the quarterback, and that's how fans are. But it's time to start talking about the quarterback. No, they, listen, there's, there's no doubt about it, John. Because, you know, when you run the ball as effectively as they ran it tonight, that's your opportunity to build your offense off of that run game. Um, you know, and, and I just don't see it. I talked about it in the pregame. 
take what the defense is giving you, move the chains. They did it in the first drive, and they did it in the third third drive. 15 plays, touchdown. 16 yeah. plays, a penalty prevents that from being a touchdown. You kick a field goal, you're up 10 to nothing. And then the jump over on the defensive side of the ball, you know, before I pass it back to Mike, it seemed like to me, I'm watching the personnel that's on the field. This team looked like a team tonight that was trying to find out things about a bunch of young players. It didn't look like to me that they looked at this game from the lens of we got to win this game because Dallas lost yesterday and we got to do what's necessary to, to maintain the spot that we're in to give us a leg up in order to win the division and hopefully hope that San Francisco lose one. I mean, Patrick Johnson hadn't played all, all year. And then you got yeah. him, you got him and Nolan Smith in the game. You had Eli Ricks yeah. playing, Josh Joe playing. This looked like a team on defense to me. It looked like a team, John, that was out of the playoff picture, and we're evaluating some young players to see what we're gonna do with them next year. And that's what it looked like to me. Yeah, I, you know, I'm a little bit torn on what they were doing from a personnel standpoint. I hope one day to get to talk to Matt Patricia. I don't know if that's ever coming, but um, it, it- He ain't gonna you know, tell you that, John. <laughs> well, just from the, that was a, sort of an inside baseball joke because he doesn't have to talk to us because he's technically not the defensive coordinator. Wow. So <laughs> this goofy situation that the Eagles have set up, but with, with with Patrick Johnson, Nolan. By the way, I'm I'm concerned about Nolan Smith's shoulder. I mean, mm-hmm. he's he's always got an issue. If you guys remember, way back, he said it's it's my baby. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I said, well, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> he's always got a chronic chronic shoulder injury. So I'm concerned about that. Number one. They're trying to take snaps off, obviously, Josh Sweat and Hassan Reddick. They probably got to it too late. Again, week 15, why Why is this starting now? The corners bother me only because, and I got to rewatch the game, obviously, but I didn't notice anything glaringly bad um, from Ringo. I, in fact, I thought he was holding up pretty well. Um, Metcalf, I think, only had one catch in the in the first half, um, and they're you know they're going Mark Ivoroni, Bobby Jones, maybe Michael get that reference. You know why is Ringo starting and 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 Rick's finishing if Ringo's not playing for him? Like what is that? I, I I don't understand. They they went to the three safety look a bunch. That's fine because they don't have any linebackers. So they're trying to piecemeal it together. But the, the Ringo stuff bothers me because, you know, if you're giving them a chance, give them a chance. We've seen a lot of Eli Riggs. Yeah, John, I get that reference. That it was 1983 Sixers. They started Mark Arveroni. They finished with Bobby Jones. <laughs> All right, so I got, to, I got where you're going with that. Uh, but but I, I, this team is not – being coached well enough right now and like we always look at the head coach who's who's got the the cards and and he he wants to, to oversee the whole thing where does nick sirianni fall in line here with blame oh a ton of blame i mean how he handled this week was just absurd and his uh, obsessive uh just nonsense with competitive advantage and he brought it up after the game that was my take because look you open up these questions again with the offensive play caller like he gets he gets pissed when people ask him about the play he he loves brian johnson he doesn't even think it's a question to think about replacing brian johnson but Then to replace Sean Desai and give that nonsensical, he's my guy basically on Tuesday, and then you're turning around um, two days later and you're making a change, that opens up the floodgates that he doesn't understand he creates these own issues is a problem. 
And then if you think about this team's history, and it's a recent history with Doug Peterson, so immediately, and you can't blame people for saying, it's just Jeff, Jeffrey Lurie stepping in. Is this Howie Roseman stepping in? They've done it in the past. But no, Nick just wants competitive advantage. Like Pete Carroll gives a flying you-know-what about, you know, what they're doing on the defensive side of the football. Um, it, it, it could be as simple as, you know, the injury. Go back to Dallas Goddard. Um, when Dallas told me flat out, the medical team said four weeks, four weeks, four weeks, just the bone needed um, a specific time to heal. And he was playing the games with San Francisco. Like, this is nonsense. Um, and he opens up the door to, to not only questions, but also the panic part of it. They come across as a team in disarray because of the way the head coach handled last week. John? John? <laughs> Can I go so far as to say that this scenario looks eerily similar to how 2018 and 19 began to unravel? And I would like to go so far as to say that what you witnessed this week, you know, with Nick Sirianni saying on Tuesday, I believe it was, when asked whether there was going to be any kind of change, emphatically, no, I like the people that are in the house, okay? The, I know you recall at one point, you know, the Eagles made a move under Doug Peterson, and then they rolled him out in front of the whole world, you know, to take the fall. This looks and feels like a similar situation. You know, the disarray comes because, you know, we believe that Nick Sirianni has some type of control in the building when in actuality, he really doesn't. That the puppet master and the guy behind the, 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 the curtain that's pulling all the levers and throwing all the switches, the great and wonderful Oz is the one that's really doing it all. See, I, I get why you say that, uh, Seth, and that's why I was uh, bringing that up because you're right, Doug Peterson came up and wanted Mike Groh back and said he would be back. And then Jeffrey Lurie told him, no, Mike Rowe's not going to be back. And then Doug had to come back tail between his legs, fire Mike Rowe and say, um, and, 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 and do all that. And then if you fast forward, same thing happened with Press Taylor, uh, Matt Burke, when he wanted to change the coaching staff, he wasn't allowed to change the coaching staff. This was Nick's decision. <laughs> It was not Jeffrey telling him to change it. This was Nick's decision. And how do we know that, John? He, he, he did it for competitive advantage. How do we know that? Well, I can't give you my sources, but I know it. And he's a goofball with competitive advantage. And we've had this discussion uh, behind the scenes. He believes other coaches don't take it seriously enough. And he's trying to always gain, even if it's a, an inch here or there. And obviously, Pete Carroll knows Sean Desai well. But guess what? It's going to get out. They did a good job keeping it under wraps for a couple of days, but it got out. It doesn't matter. And you create this environment where everybody is, then they ask the logical question. Instead, that's a logical question. Jeffrey did it in the past. Why wouldn't he do it now? You open up the doors to these kinds of, of controversies that don't need to be opened up. Now, if you firmly believe Sean Desai is so bad at his job, why is he still in the building? <laughs> why is he still in the building? So hey. all of this comes back to Nick Sirianni because... He hired him in the first place because all the players wanted Denard Wilson. Um, but he didn't want Denard because Denard wanted to, to shift a little bit further away. I wouldn't even say shift. He wanted to evolve from the Fangio, the strict Fangio scheme. Still going to use it, but he wanted to do some different things. 
and Nick wanted to stay the course and and get a Fangio guy. How's that so working? So already out for him? he made the wrong decision. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, this is all Nick Sirianni's fingerprints are all, all over this. Okay, let, let, let me. So the Eagles are actually, after neutering Sean Desai, going to continue to trot him out in front of the media to answer questions because he's still technically the defensive coordinator, but no longer the play caller. Well, it remains to be seen because we don't know what's going to happen this week. But they can do that, you know. <laughs> Um, of, of the, the they only really, they really want him to. to they really to want him to quit. They, they really want him to quit. He doesn't have to quit. He's under a guaranteed contract. I wouldn't. If you put, if you put me in a wheelchair and tried to roll me out there, I wouldn't go out. <laughs> they there. still have to pay him if he quits. First, uh, listen, no, if he quits, they yeah, don't have to pay I don't him. think so. No, if he quits, they don't have to pay him. But here's yeah. the thing: Jeffrey Lurie doesn't care. Jeffrey Lurie wrote a check to Carson Wentz. You think you really think he's not willing? To, to, to bite the bullet on two years of Sean Desai's contract if, if that's the right thing to do for this organization. No, He'll but I think, I, a, think I think he would try I think he would try to milk it where he doesn't have to pay him and he takes that option first but but by saying, okay, we, we've just neutered you. Well, so rich you have no choice but to quit. Checks, but, yeah, yeah but I mean, it's really, it's, it's, it's better not to pay a couple million dollars than to pay a couple million dollars, right? Yeah, he's willing. He's willing to do it, though. I, I mean, I, I never doubt that Jeffrey's willing uh, to to spend money to win. But, um, yeah, as far as Sean Desai, again, I don't know what the Eagles are going to do, um, but they can by the letter of the NFL's law, because technically Sean Desai is the defensive coordinator. He can be uh, what I called uh, uh, Matt Patricia's press secretary, because technically Matt Patricia doesn't have to talk to us. <laughs> we'll see how go, they this, this is yeah. down. I want to go to the offensive comical. side of the ball real quick. Back in 2017, Carson Wentz gets injured, but he's an MVP caliber player. Last year, Jalen Hurts takes this team to the Super Bowl MVP caliber player. The following year, Jalen Hurts is not playing the same way. Do you see a path of similarity there? Are you worried that Hurts just maybe doesn't have it and it was a one-and-done year for him? Or do you think there's more talent there and it's just the higher-ups that's not working out for Jalen Hurts in the offensive scheme? No, I, I, I'm not concerned because he's played very well at times this year. He's had stretches where he's played even better, especially as a passer. Uh, than he than he did last season, but the consistency hasn't been there from game to game like it was last year. Obviously, the turnovers are up. Uh, he keeps pushing the football, as I mentioned, down the field. Uh, maybe maybe because of the offensive struggles, there are three consecutive losses, three consecutive games that haven't scored 20 points. Maybe he's pressing a little bit. Um, I thought he looked great in the in the early moments of this game. I mean that that first drive was tremendous, um, and even the the third drive uh, that ended with the Jake Elliott field goal that probably would have been a touchdown if Kelsey didn't try to steal a yard. Um, I you know they looked good, and then all of a sudden nothing. And really, Nick was talking about the, the two-minute at, at the end of the first half. That was awful. I mean, from both teams. That was as bad a two-minute sequence as you'll see. Um, they went 19 seconds, and they, had, they somehow had a co completed pass to Devontae Smith for 15 yards and still only took 19 seconds off the clock. I don't even know how you do that. I'm still amazed. Hey, John, do you think it's a philosophical thing, this thing that um, Jalen Hurts is trying to push the ball down the field? Because I've been talking about this all year. The Eagles are not a football team, it seems to me, you know, that, that's willing to take what the defense has given them. They are a team that really wants to stretch the field. Nick believes in explosive plays, you know. So you see Jalen, and, and I was talking to somebody on Twitter just the other day about this same exact thing, you know. When your philosophy is to stretch the field and push the ball down the field, the layups and the easy throws seem to become, you know, a secondary thought. 
And sometimes you get yourself in a situation where you don't even get the chance to come back to those plays or, or, or those opportunities because you're looking down the field so much and you're waiting for the, the play down the field to open up so much, okay? Now, this team has seen that it hasn't worked. Even their explosive plays are down from where they were last year. I can understand why they would feel like, oh, this is our offensive philosophy because our offense was so explosive last week last year but this not being the case in the scenario with this team this year why do you keep trying to force a round peg into a square hole why don't they just why don't they adjust that and 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 my real my real question is is that truly their philosophy do they really believe that that's the way you're going to win when it's not working are they really still really willing to do it that way because they came out in that first drive that you're talking about john they ran the ball 10 times they threw it five times. Those five passes that he threw was a pass to Dallas Goddard to convert a third down, a pass to A.J. Brown in the gap in the zone to convert, you know, and, and get another, another third down situation. Why are they so adverse to just taking what the defense is giving them? You move down the field 75 yards. Are you kidding me? Why wouldn't you stay with that game plan? Why do you have to get so impatient to try to be greedy and take what's not just naturally there for you to have? Well, I think part of it is the prior success, as you mentioned. You can look at Kansas City. I mean, Kansas City, um, when they lost Tyreek Hill, there was like a six, seven game span where they were struggling. Um, you know, everybody, and actually when Tyreek was still there, and everybody said, you know what, we're not going to let them, um, we're not going to let them beat us with big plays and they were playing the safeties in the parking lots and, and Patrick Mahomes got frustrated and was pushing the football down the field because he was used to big plays um, and it took him a while to adjust to what was being done to them. I get that same kind of feeling with the Eagles right now but they gotta they gotta be quicker to make the adjustment um, and it's tough. I, you know, I remember the Colts Bears Super Bowl. I'll, I'll never forget. The Bears jumped out to an early lead, and the Bears were a big cover two team at the time with Brian Urlacher. And Peyton Manning uh, tried to push the football down the field, and he got intercepted. And, and the Bears were up early, but you could see on his face, he was literally saying, "I got it. I got it. I know what I did wrong." And, you know, Peyton was such a cerebral player. He just picked him apart for the rest of the game, and they won easily. I don't see the Eagles being able to, to, to pivot like that that quickly, but they, they need to pivot. They need to understand defenses have evolved. They're playing them differently, and you can't use what you're using last year exclusively and they do seem right now to be too hyper-focused on the big play down the field. Perfect example was the end of the game there. You need basically 15 yards to give Jake Elliott a shot, and you're taking a deep shot to A.J. Brown in, in, in double coverage. I, I, why? Yeah, And they had sense. two timeouts, I believe, left. Yep. John, thanks for hanging out with us late. Uh, I don't know where this season is going. It looks to me like it's going into the great abyss. But uh, we'll catch you next week. Thanks for uh, uh Tommy Cutlet's insights. here to save it. Yeah, don't worry uh, about it. <laughs> John McMullen brought to us by Del Val Insurance. You can save up to 40% of your car insurance right now. Just call partners Fran or Jim at Del Val Insurance. And here's how you can connect with Del Val. Hi everybody, my name is Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at DryTech. At DryTech we offer three major services. The first one being basement waterproofing. The second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs. And then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you are having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online.